You've probably noticed that people like to compare things, right? Their clothes, their cars, their favorite TV shows, their, you know, stuff. And while it can lead to some engaging, passionate and fun discussions, it can also get uh, angry and unnecessary and pointless and silly at times because people just really enjoy hearing that the thing that they happen to really like is better than what somebody else likes. So because I like to talk about swords and other cool stuff, there's of course plenty of discussions that arise and lots of questions and people ask things like, what's your favorite such and such? What's the best sword? What's the best armor? What's the best fleshlight? It's the internet after all. And while I'm happy to answer specific questions like what's your favorite sword you own, these two, Albion Knecht and Galloglass, as of now, I have, I have plenty of others that I really like, but if I have to pick, then I can pick. But sometimes the questions are so broad and vague that they become almost irksome, you know, like pet peeve level. For example, your opinion on Chinese swords, go. No offense to anybody who asked that question. It's probably asked by somebody who is unaware of the overwhelming variety. I could tell you my opinion of this Chinese sword here, or rather this particular reproduction of a certain type of Chinese sword. This is a Dao, and the subtype is Liu Ye Dao, uh, with a heavily accented Westerner pronunciation, of course. So it can make some general statements about this type of Dao. Design and material quality are not always going to be the same, and even within subtypes there is some variation. So I could talk about this, but I cannot possibly talk about all Chinese swords in general in their entirety based on this, because this is very different from a Jin, for example. This is a saber. That is a double-edged sword. They are quite a bit different. And again, both have subtypes which are going to be substantially different. If you compare that to a Dadao, for example, there's that kind of problem. And then when people actually compare swords, that's something that they don't really take into consideration most of the time. They will just compare one very broad type, which quite often is sort of an umbrella term, to another umbrella kind of sword. Like the classic, of course, is Longsword versus katana. Everybody's favorite. People still talk about that sometimes. Now, if you look up the term longsword, there, there are certain types that will pop up more often. These are fairly common generic examples, but there's so many different types. The Oakshot typology has a, a variety of different blades from different time periods, and even within a subtype, you have different variations. So, to give you an example, the type 13A, often called a great sword of war. These were used between the 12th and 15th century, really mainly 13th and 14th, and they have a very wide cutting blade. Now, if you compare that to an oakshot type 15, mainly 14th and 15th century, they couldn't be much more different, really. On the one hand, you have a wide blade with not a lot of taper. On the other hand, you have a slender blade, strongly tapered, with a diamond cross-section, often with a pronounced central ridge. That's the line you can see in the center of the blade, uh, sometimes with a hollow grind. And um, the purpose is very different. They were designed to be used against different types of armor. This one would go up against mainly mail, a very limited plate, this much more plate coverage, so this would be more important for thrusting into the gaps of the armor because just blunt impact is not going to cut it. And on some Type 15s, the blades are downright needles. They are very, very strongly tapered into a, a really fine point. So this is not really a cutting sword. Now, there are cut and thrust blades, like the Oakshot Type 18C, mainly 15th century, so they also are strongly tapered. Uh, the 18B sometimes looks like it's entirely for thrusting. I reviewed one made by Lockwood a while ago, and that particular one, considering the way the edge geometry was, I do not consider suitable for cutting, really. But generally, this type is capable of cutting as well, just not nowhere near as well as 813A, for example. However, some Type 18C blades have a very wide base and a flattened diamond cross-section. 
And although they taper substantially, they don't turn into a needle point, and they can cut surprisingly well. Uh, like the Albion Principe, for example, that I've had a chance to cut with. It's considered by a lot of people in HEMA as a cheat code for cutting, because it makes it stupidly easy in the sense that it's actually bad for beginners because they can get away with improper technique because the, the blade is just such a monstrous cutter that it is very forgiving. So this, if you just look at the profile overall, you may think eh, more of a thruster, but it can cut exceptionally well. And if you look at this Albion Gallo glass, for example, the blade is fairly narrow. The camera may distort that a little bit. If I move it in, it looks really huge, but uh, it's, it's not a terribly wide blade. And usually wider blades cut way better than narrow ones. In general, as a rule of thumb, there are exceptions. What makes it here is the overall blade geometry. So for one, this is pretty thin. I bring it in a little closer. You can see that it is not a thick blade by any means, and it's got a pretty good grind. So you can see from the center, there is a gradual taper toward the edge. So you could take two sword blanks with identical profile, same length, same thickness, same width, but you could turn them into something completely different in terms of cutting performance, depending on how you grind that bevel. If you take a flat blade and simply put an edge bevel on it, so just hit the very edge, you just grind it right there and call it a day, it's going to be terrible in the cut. It's not going to be good because you have these this two straight parallel lines that form the flat of the blade, and then you have this abrupt change into the edge bevel, so you have basically a corner that creates a lot of drag in the material. Whereas if you started the grind closer to the center and actually made a transition toward the edge and made it taper over a longer distance and more evenly, you've got a much, much better angle. You've got a better transition. If you polish that well, it's going to cut really nicely. And this is one of the design elements that make Japanese swords so good at cutting. A lot of people seem to look just at the profile and they think, oh, it's because of the curvature and because the edge is very, very sharp. Yes, the edge is very sharp, but really more important than just the apex of the two surfaces of, of the blade meeting. It's the surfaces as well that matter a lot. So here you have a comparatively thick blade, at least compared to a lot of European double-edged swords, and it's not super wide, but it tapers like all the way, either all the way from the spine or from the fuller. It's a nice gradual, finely tapered, kind of a, a slender wedge that really drives into the, the material and spreads it apart and causes a nice clean cut. Since we're already at the wedge analogy, tell me, which axe is better? Pick one. I'm not going to give you a context. Just, just pick one. Which is better? Yeah, better for what, right? Based on the profile, you can make some inferences. I mean, if, if you're a lumberjack or woodworker, you probably already know. You probably already, you, you might even know the maker, all of that. But this, this is, this is where it's at. Now you can make a more informed decision, right? At least if you, if you've worked with axes before or you know how they work. This is for chopping, this is for splitting. If you use them interchangeably, not going to be a good result. Imagine you had to try to delimit a tree with this. Good luck with that, right? Better. So if you want comparison, what do you compare it to? A longsword. What is a longsword? What is a generic longsword? You can compare it to a particular type, um, and then you have a lot more to work with. Uh, then, of course, when it gets into practical tests, comparing different reproductions, then there's another element, of course. You have to compare equivalent qualities. You cannot compare, for example, a $100 katana to a, an $800 longsword, or, or vice versa. It just it won't work. If you compare the cutting performance to an 18A, it's going to be very different than if you compare it to a 15 or an 18B. Sometimes people take it a little too far in the opposite direction, 
where they say every sword or every object really that humans use is perfectly adapted to the purpose and the situation that they're in. So you can't criticize them at all because th this is what they were designed to do at the time, all of that. And of course, historical context and purpose and everything are very, very important. But people are not always doing things 100% optimally. For example, I made a video about scythes, talking about how they went through a certain evolution until they ended up at what seems to be the optimal shape. And we're still using that shape after centuries of no change. So sometimes you can arrive at a design that is really ideal and that doesn't need to be modified much anymore. But until you arrive there, there may be quite a bit of alteration along the way. Plus, sometimes things are being altered or, or new things are being introduced, not for entirely practical reasons. Sometimes it's fashion. Like a small sword, for example. If you look at the history of swords, you could jump to the conclusion that the small sword replaced the rapier. Now, they existed side by side for a while, but eventually the small sword became dominant. So you might be tempted to think, oh, the small sword is the better sword than a rapier. But I would definitely disagree with that. Uh, somebody who practices small sword and is really good at it and, and loves the thing may disagree with me on that, but I would rather have a rapier because you can cut with it. It's longer and gives you more reach. It's it seems like a more versatile type of sword. You can't always say what people did at a given moment in time was optimal. Otherwise, doctors would still diagnose humor imbalances and prescribe bloodletting for all kinds of illnesses. So after all these examples and expositional blah blah, you may also understand why I find it a little silly when people call this sword here, that Kriegsmesser or war knife, a European katana. There's a touchy, but the point still remains. Um, I, in some cases, that's clearly jokes because people think that somehow triggers me or whatever. I've seen some discussions where people were honestly trying to make that point, though. And uh, so, if you look at them, there's, there's really there's no real similarity in any way, shape, or form. Basically, the similarity is both are two-handed and both are curved and single-edged. That's it. You have a much wider blade. You have a very different blade geometry. You have, of course, a very different guard. You have a completely different handle and hilt assembly and pommel and everything. <laughs> different steel, different making process, differential hardening in one case versus monotemper and the other. There's so many things going on here that are so different. And, and if you pick them up, if you hold them side by side, yes, they, they, are, they are very, very different. This is almost a shovel versus spade sort of thing, where a lot of people confuse the two and think they look similar at first glance, but they are quite a bit different and are used differently and all that. Uh, but what happens if you try to combine them? Generally, nothing good. Um, this is a double-edged katana. Um, this is... Some people will probably call this a katana longsword hybrid. And trust me, it's not. It really isn't. It is a lighter, worse katana, essentially. Because what happened here is... So, up until this point, it is, it is a katana. Like the blade is the same, the geometry is generally the same aside from an extra fuller there in the center. That makes it a little strange. When you try to hybridize and combine different design elements, it can go horribly wrong because you may end up taking something away that another part of the design builds on. You have a handle that's intended for use with a single edge blade. What do you do with the double edge? Well, you can do a false edge cut by essentially reversing your downward cut. So you can false edge cut like this. With a long sword, I can constantly change between the two edges in various ways quite easily. Like for example, instead of throwing a downward cut with the true edge, I can use the thumb grip and cut with the false edge. 
this gives me a different angle. Instead of doing a rising cut with the true edge, I can use the opposite edge and deliver a cut that way. Can I do that with this design? Kind of, but poorly. For one, I would not want to push my thumb through the tuba because that just invites injury. So I'd have to choke down lower and uh, I can, I can kind of do that, but it's just, it's very suboptimal compared to having a different type of handle. It is possible to make hybrids work. It's just a little tricky and it depends on what you want to emphasize. Like for example, this is an actual longsword katana hybrid designed by windless steelcrafts and this really when you look at the blade this is really only vaguely reminiscent of a katana but this is kind of what you have to do because if you stick very close to the actual shape of a katana and you're going pretty far away from a longsword if you stick fairly close to a longsword you get the idea the other way around i think this is actually a pretty good compromise overall so you have the, the curvature is that of a katana uh, the blade width is more like a longsword the length is closer to a katana the thickness more like a longsword the edges longsword uh, the guard is more katana like the grip is is really a hybrid you have these risers on the grip that make it aesthetically reminiscent of the traditional katana wrap it's got a small pommel it's pretty symmetrical overall and uh, you can switch grip pretty easily but is this better than a longsword and a katana separately like is this the best of both worlds combined is this the ultimate sword is this better no it's different well this video got a little longer than i had planned but there's just a lot to talk or maybe rant about uh, perhaps this helps you understand the complexities of sword designs a little better. There's so much more that one could talk about. I mean, if I've ruined your fun because you genuinely enjoy angrily typing about the bestest sword ever and how all the others are garbage, and I'm sorry. Okay, I'm not. But it was fun to talk about this. Uh, that's all I can say. I hope it was fun to watch too. I hope you enjoyed yourself. If at the same time you learned a thing or two, even better. Either way, thank you for watching and have a good one, folks. Angry typing.